again and praise you, Lord, and pray that you would speak mightily today. Uh, we thank you for the VBS that's going on downstairs. We thank you for the children that are involved. And we pray, Lord, that, that you are teaching them about your love. And pray, Lord, that they would be encouraged, Lord, to walk in faith, Lord. Um, so, Father, we thank you again for your provision. And pray, Lord, that we would continue to reflect upon you and to uh, just bask in your glory. We thank you again and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Cool. Well, welcome to News. This is your first time here. Um, as I've been saying for a long time, we're going through the book of Acts, and it's, it's been from the beginning of the year, we're, we're, we're now in chapter 16, um, we're eventually going to finish, um, I do promise that eventually we will finish, hopefully within this year, um, actually probably, I'm, I'm thinking we'll probably end around October or November, regardless, we've been going through and it's been, I've had a, I've had a good time, um, because for me, God's been revealing a lot of things I've never seen before. And for us, really, is we're looking at the history of the church and missions and seeing how God wants us to apply that for our own ministry. And so I'm going to speak from that context, and I just hope God speaks to you today. All right? So today's passage comes from Acts 16, verses 6 to 40. Um, Acts 16, verses 6 to 40. Now, before we get to that, the question I want to ask today is, you know, the title of the message is Decorps, right? So you're going along a certain path, and all of a sudden, that path is blocked, and you have to go a different way. And so my question is, how do you deal with stuff like that, just generally in life? How do you deal with changes of plan? Okay. How many of you are cool with whenever you know things change? You're very impulsive, go with the flow, no problem. Anybody? Oh, we got a couple people. How many of you... If the plan changes, your life is ruined. You're like, what? What's going on? We had a plan. How many of you are like that? Okay. You know, there's a there's those personality tests. Uh, what is it? Yeah, Myers Briggs. There's different ones. Um, you know, for me, I always I always grade out as an ISTJ. Uh, was an introvert, sensing, thinking, judging. So I'm like the <laughs> prototypical engineer. No impulsive behavior. You know, I follow the rules. You know, you, you just give me some order and I love it, right? And so for me, my sister, uh, the funny thing is my eldest sister is an ENFP. So we are exact opposites of each other. So she loves to just, you know, make things up and do it on the fly. I'm like, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right? So some of you, you know, in terms of things changing, no problem, right? You just go with the flow. Others of you, you have a plan and you're like, whoa. That's not right. We got to stick to the plan. Right? Now, for me, like I said, I'm an ISTJ. Um, I used to work for Motorola. Okay, I worked for Motorola for seven years, and while I worked for Motorola, I never had a cell phone. <laughs> that really bothered me. Okay? My, my, actually, Motorola only gave me a two-way pager, which was kind of a big deal back then. But you know, I didn't have a cell phone, and, and so people were, were just completely perplexed. They're like, how do you live? Right? Like. Well, what if, what if plans change? I was like, they shouldn't change. I was like, we, we made an agreement. You're supposed to be here. And they're like, well, you know, what if I'm running late? I was like, <laughs> you don't run late. <laughs> we had a plan, right? And so, so people got so upset with me because they could never reach me, right? But I was like, hey, we made an agreement. I was there. Where were you? Right? Now, when I came to Korea... I realized that it was impossible to live in Korea without a cell phone. So it wasn't until I moved to Korea back in 2009 when I actually got my first cell phone. Right? Kind of amazing. And some of you people are like, how did you live your life? <laughs> anyway, so for me, as you can tell, I'm not someone that, that goes well with changes of plan. Um, but regardless, the passage we're going to go through today, we're going to see multiple changes of plan and how particularly Paul and Silas went with that. So let's go to Acts 16, verses 6 to 40. The word Lord says this. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to, so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begged him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. 
you know, I kind of think of Star Wars of like Princess Leia and come on anyway. Um, so after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we, we put out to sea and sailed straight for uh, Samothrace, and at the next day we went to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Ma Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of uh, Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Sorry, that was my possessed girl voice. Um, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was com uh, commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors uh, flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison door, uh, doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. He, he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their uh, officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailers told Paul, the magistrates have, have, avoid, uh, have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Amen. Long passage. A um, lot of stuff going on here. I'm going to try to condense it as much as I can to, to really get to what's going on. Right? So as we talked about last week, um, the second missionary journey had started. Right? They, they were going off and... and they had decided, Paul had decided, let's go back to the churches that we started in the first missionary journey and encourage them. That was a plan that they had made. But then Paul and Barnabas got into an argument. They didn't really, Paul didn't want to take John Mark, Barnabas did. And because of that, they separated and they went their own ways and Paul brought Silas instead. So that's kind of the background of what's happened. They're, they're starting this missionary trip. There's been this kind of you know, sad breakup between two close buddies. And now, all of a sudden, when we go to the passage, it says immediately they were kept from going to Asia. 
If anything, you actually see that the Spirit was leading them away from Asia into Europe, if you look on the map. So God completely changes the direction that they were going. And they started going to those churches that they had gone to, just as planned, but then all of a sudden, as they decided to go further, the Spirit of the Lord told them, no, go in the opposite direction. Go to Europe, where the gospel has not yet reached. So what started as a missionary trip of encouragement, all of a sudden became about planting churches again. And you'll see further on that it's, it's going to be a very unusual trip because there's going to be a long break in the middle. They're going to go to Corinth. They're going to stay there for a year and a half. So it's a very unusual missionary trip compared to the first one. And what you're seeing is the Spirit is directing them. You saw that there was a vision. Right? For me, again, I watched a little bit too much Star Wars when I was a kid, and I see Princess Leia like, you know, in a holographic image coming out of R2-D2. Um, but, but some of you don't even know what that means. Um, but, 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 you know, there was a vision, right? God spoke to them in a vision, and there's a man that said, Come to Macedonia. Bring the gospel to Macedonia. And so we can see that they changed their plan. We'll get back to that in a second. But, but you see that they're being led by the Spirit and not necessarily by what they had in mind when they first started the trip. Now what we also see is all of a sudden, it's always they in the book of Acts, until all of a sudden, just a couple verses ago, it switched to we, if you didn't catch that. Right? It went from they to we. Right? Third person, um, what is it? Third person plural, first person plural. Right? It's a switch. I know some English, I guess. <laughs> but it goes to we, and the reason why is because now the author, Luke, has actually joined, and he's speaking from his first-hand first -hand encounters of what happened. It's believed that Luke joins them from Choaz. And as we know, Luke was a doctor. Um, the, part of the reasons why Luke's writings are even in the Bible is because he was basically part of Paul's entourage. So he was very close with Paul, and he followed Paul, and saw all that happened from this second missionary journey on. And so we're getting first-hand encounters, first-hand um, recollection of what happened through, through, through Luke at this point. And we also see the, one of the first times that Paul ends up in jail. Now this is the first of many jail stays. You know, you, you see like books like Philippians, they were written while Paul was in jail. Some of the early church fathers actually believe Paul was jailed at least seven times. Five to seven times. And, and if you total the amount of time that he was in jail, it was probably at least seven to ten years. So basically, the last third of Paul's life, he was in jail. And this is the first time it started. The, and from this point on, Paul's basically living in jails from this point on. Not a very fun life, right? I don't know how many of you plan to jail hop. <laughs> but that, that was Paul's life for, for the latter part of his year. But another interesting thing that we see is the difference between Silas and Barnabas, right? Paul and Barnabas was this dynamic duo for about 10 years, working together, doing all sorts of ministry. But Barnabas, he was a Hebraic Jew. He had no rights as a Roman citizen. Silas, we find out from this passage, he was a Roman citizen. So all of a sudden, Paul starts talking, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. And all of a sudden, he's taking advantage of the privileges that he had from that status that he, did, he couldn't before. It's not like when he was a Barnabas, he's like, I'm a Roman citizen. They're like, well, what about him? Well, don't worry about him. <laughs> Put him in jail. <laughs> right? so, so now he's actually with a team that they can actually have the same status and take advantage of that in that way. And we see Paul and Silas from this point on, you know, using their status as Roman citizens. So we can see that when, when Paul split up, or when God split up Paul and Barnabas from each other, there was a purpose behind it. That this new team was actually able to do certain things that the other team, previous team, could not have done. And like I said last week, you know, when God split up Paul and Barnabas, it's not like Paul all of a sudden became less effective. If anything, the ministry was doubled because now there are two teams of ministry versus just one. Right? And now we're seeing a new team that can do new things that couldn't be done before. Now, there are two main things I want to emphasize in this passage. And the first is that, especially from the beginning of the passage, these men are being led by the Holy Spirit. Like I said before, they had a plan in place. Their plan was to go back to these old churches, encourage them, and come back. That was their plan. But as you see, 
The Spirit kept them from going to Asia. The Spirit actually led them to Macedonia and up toward Europe. That's the characteristic of this second missionary journey. They were led by God. They were led by the Spirit. We sung about the Holy Spirit earlier. And I know last week I talked about, you know, the number one question that people always ask me as a pastor is, what do I do with my life? I don't know what my future is. Give me some direction. Everyone's always asking me that. I don't know why. And what I think this passage shows very clearly is that, you know, in terms of myself, the guidance that the only guidance I can really give you is trust in God. Listen to the Spirit. Go as the Spirit leads. Because that's what Paul did. That's what we see in this passage. Now, how the Spirit spoke to them, it's not very clear. Aside from the vision before that, it says the Spirit kept them from Asia. We don't know exactly what happened. We don't know whether it was, um, you know, whether it, there was a prophetic word or, or whether there, there was anything very particular that, that, that led them in that direction. But one thing to, to, to just kind of get off the chest is the way that I've experienced God tends to speak is usually through three different means. First off is the Bible, through the Word of God. A lot of times when people are looking for direction, when they go to the Word, oftentimes God speaks directly to them through the Word of God. Okay? Now the other time is, is oftentimes God will actually speak to you directly. Whether, like in this passage, it's through a vision, whether for myself it's actually through convictions. Um, some people, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll have these, these dreams and stuff like that. There's different means. And then the last mean is actually through other people. So you have the word, either direct word from God, or when God speaks through other people to you. And so whenever people ask me, what am I supposed to do in my life? The first thing I always tell them is, well first, build your relationship with God again. You know, if, if it's lacking, if, if, if your, your walk with God isn't as strong as it could be, focus on that first. Because God will often speak as you're building that relationship up again. He will speak to you through the Word. He will speak to you, oftentimes in different ways. And He will also speak to you through people. Surround yourself with people that are in the Word, surrounded, uh, or people that are in prayer, because they can give you godly wisdom and advice. Now, when it comes to you know visions and, and dreams and stuff like that, you know there are some people that God tends to speak more often in that way. I've noticed that, that with different types of people, God speaks in different ways. For myself, per particularly, God tends to speak to me in convictions. It's hard for me to explain, but, but generally, God gives me a very, just, a, a strong conviction in a particular way. That's what led me to Korea. That's what kept me in Korea. That's, often, that's also what brought me here to Namso. Because honestly, if I were going by my plan, right, the plan that I made when I was younger. First off, I would have been married at 25. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, still not married yet, so I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I would have had kids by 28. That's, that was a long time ago, too. <laughs> so a lot of my plans kind of fell through, right? And my original plan for seminary was I thought I would go to seminary five years after college. It ended up being nine. And the last place I would have chosen if I were to go by my plan would have been Korea. Right? So if everything went to my plan, I would already be married with kids, but I would be in America. Right? I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. And then even recently, I, I thought God was leading me more toward um, campus ministries. I was serving at Yonsei University. I was doing bilingual ministry there. And I, I honestly didn't think God wanted me to do English ministry anymore. And then he made it clear that he wanted me here at Amto to do English ministry again. Again, the choices I've made in many ways are not the choices I, wish I would have made if it was my choice, if that makes any sense to you. And for me, I, I try to follow God. I try to follow as he leads. Now when it comes to how he speaks to you, the Word and other people are important because God gives you standards, right? He doesn't just speak to you in visions and you got to figure it out on your own. He gives you the Bible to test anything that you see. Right? If, if, you, if you hear or feel a particular thing, the Bible always stands there because God will never contradict His Bible. He will never contradict His Word. 
You have that as a, a, you know, as a standard. And he also surrounds you with people that will give you godly wisdom and advice to either confirm or to discourage you from a particular path. So simply, to be led by the Spirit is to be in relationship with God, to be in His Word, to be in prayer, to be listening to Him, but to also be in community where others can encourage you. And we see that through Paul and Silas, that they were being led by the Spirit through this missionary journey. Now the other thing that you also see is, they get put in jail. And you would think that they would be discouraged, you would think that they would be bummed out, and they would just be sitting there, boo-hoo is me, right? But the passage says they were praying and they were singing hymns. That's a very unusual response to be put in jail. Have you guys been in jail before? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so, so you see that, that this is a very interesting thing. Is They're following God, but instead of being blessed and instead of all the doors opening for them, things are actually getting harder. Right? They get thrown in jail. And their response to that is prayer and praise. Brothers and sisters, this is very interesting. Because I think for us, whenever we reach ad adversity, whenever we reach things that are difficult for us, these are probably the last things that we'll go to. Right? I think most of us would just complain. <laughs> Some of us maybe would just kind of hold it in until we can't anymore and then we'll blow up. Right? But what we see here is worship in the place of adversity. Now, now, when you go to the passage, um, the interesting thing with Paul is he never stops ministering no matter where he is. Right? You would think that if you take someone that's been preaching and you put them in jail because they're preaching, that they would probably stop preaching. But he's like, no. You bring me to a new audience. I'm going to keep preaching the Word of God. And so all these people are seeing them praying and, and singing hymns, and, and, and they're seeing something is different about these people. And then they see God respond. There's this earthquake. The Spirit comes, shakes the place. Now the door is fling wide open. That's the response of God to worship. You see, He shows up in a physical way. Now one of the interesting things here is, Peter also was kind of supernaturally um, rescued from jail twice before this in the book of Acts. Right? Now the difference between Peter and, and, and Paul is that Paul actually pays attention to the people that's in the jail. Peter, if you, if you read those passages, he's just like, alright, cool, and he just leaves. Right? He doesn't think anything about the people that are left behind. Whereas Paul's like, this person's going to die if I leave. This person's going to commit suicide. So he actually cares about the jailer so much that he keeps everybody in the jail. He's like, alright guys, doors are open, but let's be cool, just stay here. Um, you know, you know, you saw what I did, I prayed, and there's an earthquake, so don't mess with me. Um, and, and because of that, not only are they released officially, but a whole household is saved. Paul sees this not as just a means of getting out, which he easily could have done. Paul sees this as a, an actually an opportunity to do even more ministry. Right? That's remarkable. Led by the Spirit, but also willing to minister even in these difficult moments. And rather than taking that easy way out of just walking out the door, he chooses to minister to the people that are responsible for him. Amazing. So for us, you know, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we take what, what's going on in these stories and bring it back to us? For some of you, you might be dealing with a you might be at a decision point right now. Right? You've been going along a particular plan, but then all of a sudden, doors are closing and you have to go in a different way. How do you face that change of plans? That's the challenge today. Is if you were going in a path and all of a sudden it's not working out, how are you going to respond? Are you going to go and seek upon God and to be led by the Spirit? Or are you going to be discouraged? Or are you going to continue to force your original plan? No matter the cost. That's the question today. Are you going to choose to be led by the Spirit? 
Are you going to lead yourself in your own way? The other thing is, you know, when adversity comes, when, when difficulty comes, how do we respond? Paul and Silas responded through prayer and praise and worship. They gave even more glory to God during the difficult times. I know that's not the natural response. If anything, when things bad happen to us, we usually blame God, right? Like, God, why, why me? Why did this happen to me? But what we see in this passage is there's no blame, there's no discouragement, there's only praise. That's a very challenging, challenging way to do things. Now at the same time, I don't want to just burden you guys by giving you more things to do. At the same time, you know, I want you to know that it comes from your relationship with Christ. It comes from the freedom that you have in Christ. It comes from His sustaining mercies and love. We can always praise God because He's a praiseworthy God. He's a good God. He's a loving God. He's always providing for us, even if we don't see it. And so for those of you that are standing at a crossroads and you have decisions to make, doors that you thought were open that might have closed in front of you, cling to God. Focus on Him. Let Him lead. Let Him love you. And from that love, worship. That doesn't mean these adversities are going to go away. That doesn't mean all of a sudden everything's honky dory again. But you'll find joy in that. Interesting thing is, you know, we started this ministry, or at least I started this ministry, preaching from the book of Philippians, which which Paul spoke from while he was, or wrote from while he was in jail. And the key word in the book of Philippians is rejoice, joy. It shows up again and again. I think like 17 times in the book alone. That a man who was stuck in jail, could not get out, was just sitting there waiting, was speaking from the place of joy. That's the challenge today. To know Christ, that you can find joy even in the darkest times. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, and pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged today. That we would see joy, Lord. That even when we, we faced difficulties, even when we're faced with having to make changes in plans, Lord, things that we don't want to do, I pray, Lord, that we would still be encouraged. That we would embrace you even more. That you would surround us with people that would give us godly wisdom, godly encouragement. That you would speak to us through your word. That, that, we, would, that we would continually just reach out to you in prayer and that you be glorified. Help us, Lord, that we would be led by your Spirit and that we would always find the desire to worship you even in our hardest moments. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, for those of you that are in VBS that need the help, this is your time to go down. Um, other than that, we're going to have the praise team come up to close us with offering.